Well, let's get started. Um, we have people who are still joining in, um, but we have a very full agenda. So we'll get started and, and people can join as they can. My name is Jana Flissrand. I'm the Community Relations Manager of Housing Link, and I want to thank you all for joining us for Breaking News, Housing Resources for Hennepin County Landlords in a Pandemic. Um, I want to especially thank the, the hosts and speakers today. The session is organized in partnership by staff of Community Mediation and Restorative Services and Housing Link. Uh, it's organized for today in part because the Minnesota Moratorium on Evictions is scheduled to end tomorrow, um, although we know that that may be extended any time, including during this workshop. If you get news of that while we're here, please let us know in the chat. Um, we've been working hard to organize this and we're especially pleased for the speakers who are here today. So Larry McDonough is an attorney and we will be sharing a recorded video he gave recently um, about the Moratorium. Uh, referee hoteling of Hennepin County Housing Court will be uh, highlighting what to expect in Hennepin Housing Court uh, and what's happening to protect public health while COVID-19 continues to spread. Then we'll hear from Heidi Boyd, uh, who uh, uh, works with the Tenant Resource Center at Hennepin County. Uh, and Heidi will be highlighting details on some new Hennepin County financial resources and streamline online application procedures that help tenants meet their rent obligation. Uh, Sue Speakman Gomez of HousingLink will follow up with some tips on leasing vacant apartments to tenants with reliable rent support. And we'll close out with Beth Bailey from CMRS, who will highlight some places to find support if you need to start a hard conversation with one of your residents, and then end up with some Q&A. We will make sure that everybody has access to a link to the recording of the video and the handouts uh, that will be hosted on the CMRS and Housing Link websites. So thank you again for joining us today. And I see Kent shared that the emergency order on evictions here in Minnesota was extended for another 30 days until July 12th. And there is a link to that um, executive order. So uh, note that that will continue for another month and the information that we're sharing here today um, is relevant and will be in place uh, when that is lifted. So my next role is to introduce Larry McDonough. Uh, he, is a he has practiced landlord-tenant law for 35 years, and he presented at a Rise and Learn session that was organized and hosted by the Heading Home Anoka Prevention and Outreach Committee. Now, that event was on April 23rd. So today, with permission, we're playing an eight-minute session of that presentation that uh, is really uh, doing an overview of the federal eviction moratorium. That eviction moratorium is scheduled to lift later this summer. Um, and with that... Okay, to go to the federal law. So why are we talking about a federal law if the, the state law seems to be pretty um, encompassing of things? Um, the federal law um, covers a certain subset of property, and if the state executive order ended before the end of the statute, then we would have some uh, evictions that would be suspended in Minnesota and some that wouldn't, and there's also some things that are regulated a little bit differently here. So this is an eviction moratorium. It operates against uh, re restricting landlords of what are called covered properties from filing eviction cases, but this also covers late fees and penalties and other charges to a tenant related to non-payment of rent. This only covers evictions for non-payment of rent. It doesn't cover other types of eviction cases. It took place on March 27 and extends to July 25, 2020. If that were to be extended, there'd have to be another law that would do this. This was not done as an emergency order by the president, it was done by the Congress. Uh, the moratorium doesn't affect cases that were filed before it went into effect or cases filed after it sunsets uh, and cases that involve non-covered tenancies, we'll talk about that in a minute, and evictions based on reasons other than non-payment of rent or fees. So what's a covered dwelling? Covered dwelling is dwelling occupied by a tenant pursuant to a residential lease or without a lease with a lease 
that could be terminated under state law and is on covered property. So what's that mean? In Minnesota, that would basically mean anybody who's a tenant. Uh, that means uh, you either have a lease or you have, you have a written lease or you have an oral lease uh, that could be generally terminated with a month to month notice. Um, that's all considered a dwelling. So the operative language here is really what's a covered property. Covered property, the, the general answer to it is a covered property is a property that's got federal either mortgage money or subsidized housing money attached to it. Okay. So here's the general definition of it. And uh, what makes this a fairly long list is almost all subsidized housing properties are covered by the Violence Against Women Act. That was a law that um, gave um, domestic violence victims um, certain rights in public and subsidized housing to not be evicted for uh, actions that were part of their victimization. Okay. And so this ends up being a pretty long list. But then also we've got federally backed mortgages and federally backed multi-housing mortgages or multi-family mortgages. So now we've got a pretty long list here. So properties under VAWA can include all these different types of subsidized housing programs. The most common one would be the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher, Section 8 Voucher, that'd be the most common one. But you also have public housing, you also have um, properties that are subsidized under other federal programs. So this is basically the federal subsidized and public housing program landscape. And that includes also properties under um, Department of Agriculture Rural Subsidized Housing Program. What's a little more vexing here is, well, first of all, I'll just finish up on this. So how to find out if you've got a property that's covered. Uh, I've got a few tips here. Uh, there's some databases. Basically, if a tenant is um, on an annual basis is having to report income, um, they're pro th that would be a very good indication that they're in one of these properties that are covered here. That's probably the easiest answer, but there also is a database um, that helps you look as well. Uh, for landlords in Anoka County, I'd say the most common is going to be a Section 8 voucher, uh, and the landlord's going to know that because they're dealing with a Section 8 office as part of that. And also, if um, they're operating under one of the uh, HUD subsidized project categories, like new construction program or something like that. Now, this is the more vexing area. A property that has a federal backed either single family or multifamily mortgage loan is going to be covered by this. Mortgage is insured by the FHA, um, Freddie Mae, Freddie Mac, the VA, Department of Agriculture. I'm guessing that for those, well, those of you that own homes, uh, you know, whether you rent them out or not, might not know if you're covered. I frankly don't know if I'm covered. I would have to go back and look at my mortgage documents to realize, to figure out if my mortgage was backed in one of these ways. And so if um, someone doesn't operate a subsidized housing program, but they've got one of these mortgages, they're covered by the federal eviction suspension. Now that may not be real relevant in Minnesota at the moment in terms of evictions, because we already have an eviction suspension. But again, if these periods of suspensions don't line up, like the federal one goes longer than the state one, it's gonna be very important to figure this out. It's also going to be very important to figure this out in terms of rent increases if you're contemplating a rent increase, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So covered properties, how to find out. Um, it, it might be in your mortgage documents. Uh, there are a few websites here where you could go and look and try to figure that out. Again, of all the things we've discussed so far, this is the one that's going to be the most mysterious because, again, most folks don't know uh, right now if their mortgage for the property they own is covered by this. Now, if you don't rent out property, you don't have to sweat this. But if you are a landlord, uh, you need to figure out if you fit within this category or not. So an affected landlord may not evict for non-payment of rent or fees until after July 25, 2020. Issue a notice to vacate for any reason until after July 25, 2020. Cannot charge late fees for late rent that accrues during this period 
of March 27, 2020 to July 25, 2020. Okay. After July 25, 2020, the moratorium also provides that a landlord may not evict a tenant after the moratorium expires, except on a 30 days notice that may not be given until after the moratorium period. So essentially July 26, a landlord could give a notice. And again, this would be a landlord of these covered properties, could give a notice to um, terminate a tenancy 30 days later. And again, this is under the federal law. So if this expires and our state executive order has extended, then that remedy would not be available until the state executive order um, is, is kind of expired, no longer extended. Thank you. I'm turning this over now to Melissa Hotelling, referee Melissa Hotelling, who will share with us a little bit now. Your video is spotlighted. All right, thank you. Um, as I stated, I'm one of the housing court referees in Hennepin County, and I've been asked to sort of provide an update to all of you about the current status of the moratorium in Minnesota, a little bit about what the court is doing related to physical safety uh, as we move into potentially hearing more cases, and then talk a little bit about what we've discussed in terms of what our calendars will look like and how we will handle cases moving forward. Um, so first and foremost, it was mentioned uh, on the chat that uh, yesterday Governor Waltz did announce that he was extending the Minnesota moratorium on evictions until, for another 30 days. Um, the caveat to that is that the legislature could do something um, to change that. Um, so it's sort of a day-by-day -day basis depending on what the legislature does in this special session. So the court had been planning that uh, on Monday the 15th we would have started uh, figuring out our summons and getting those out um, on the cases that we have a backlog on, uh, but at this time we're still holding tight until we hear more from either uh, the governor or the legislature. Um, that being said, as Larry McDonough said in his presentation, if we do have the full 30-day extension, it's going to align a bit more with the federal moratorium. Um, and if you're wanting more information about these particular moratoriums, uh, it's Executive Order 2014 was the original moratorium on evictions here in Minnesota. And then Executive Order 2073 was the one that came out last Friday. It didn't really change a whole lot. It just uh, sort of clarified and expanded some of the exceptions uh, to the moratorium, which there are some. So that gets me into sort of what are we doing now at the court and how are we handling things? So right now, uh, the types of cases uh, that we are hearing are rent escrow cases. Um, we are hearing evictions for ex on an expedited basis or an emergency basis. So any eviction where the uh, party, the landlord claims that they're uh, has been a violation of 504B.171 um, or endangers the safety of other tenants or residents or uh, the building itself. Um, we're also hearing commercial evictions and uh, we're working through some uh, expungements. So those are the th sorts of things that we are uh, handling on a, on a weekly basis at the court and that we can handle. Um, we have been handling a number of cases using Zoom, uh, so we do have a video platform that we can use to have both trials as well as initial appearances. We also allow people to appear by phone if you're more comfortable uh, appearing in that fashion. Uh, for trials, we are requiring people to use the Zoom feature so that we can have uh, video available to us to allow for credibility determinations and whatnot. Um, but we are helping people work through any technology issues that might exist if they do want to participate in a trial. Um, so in terms of physical safety at the courthouse, if you haven't been there recently, uh, the way that we have uh, ensured physical safety, hopefully for court participants, is that in the Hennepin County Government Center, everyone is required to wear a mask immediately upon coming into the building. And uh, the security, the vision is enforcing that. So when they see someone walk in, they'll ask if you have a mask. If not, they will provide you one. Uh, to eliminate some of the backlog and um, lines that can occur in security, the court towers are designated for the public. And then the, and there are two lanes open there to allow people to work through uh, the security line. And then any 
employees are to use the A tower, so on the other side of the building to get in. Elevators are restricted to two unrelated uh, parties per elevator, and there are spots both on the floor as well as uh, in the elevators as well as on the floors indicating where people can stand. We have um, hand sanitizer throughout the building uh, at elevator banks as well as on each of the floors to allow people uh, access to hand sanitizer. In addition to that, in our courtrooms, we have installed plexiglass uh, between the clerk and anyone coming up and speaking with the clerk. And then I have plexiglass on each side of me so that uh, I don't have any contact, um, close contact with the court clerks either. We've also designated what seats can be used within the courtrooms so that we're maintaining hopefully a six foot distance if we do have parties there and we are restricting the number of participants in any courtroom to 10 or less. Um, with Zoom hearings, those have been going relatively smoothly. I think people have um, enjoyed having the opportunity to not have to come downtown to, to wear a mask to um, potentially expose themselves to COVID-19. And we do allow individuals to observe hearings. So if you are uncertain about what a Zoom hearing is going to look like or how how that's going to go for you, you're more than welcome to contact our court clerk, Kristen Nelson, our law clerk, and she will provide you with a link to a hearing and you would be able to observe the hearing uh, so that you can sort of see what those look like. It helps alleviate some anxiety as to what's gonna go on here and how is this going to work. Um, when the initial appearances resume, um, what I will tell you is that we have a backlog of about 350 to 400 cases that had previously been scheduled for initial appearances but had uh, had to be canceled uh, in March and April due to um, the cessation of the court proceedings. So um, we anticipate when court initial appearances resume that we will have uh, an influx of new filings but those new filings will not be scheduled for initial appearances until after we've had the opportunity to deal with the backlog. That being said, in dealing with the backlog or any new initial appearance calendars, uh, they will look very different than what we have done in the past. So for those of you who have come to Hennepin County Housing Court in the past, you will know that we had initial appearance calendars every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoons uh, on a cattle call basis starting at uh, 1 15 and people would come and go throughout the afternoon. That will not uh, work any longer because we would have 45 lines on those calendars which could potentially uh, be you know anywhere between 90 and 100 people uh, in the courtroom or on the third floor. So what we've done and what we're planning to do is that we will have more initial appearance calendars, most likely occurring uh, almost every day, both in the mornings and in the afternoons. Um, we are coordinating with other uh, metro courts, so with Ramsey County, Anoka County, Dakota, um, so hopefully to alleviate any overlap that might exist for uh, landlords who appear in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, but we do anticipate having uh, to increase the number of calendars we have since we will have to reduce the number of cases we can hear at any given time. Our intention is that uh, for initial appearances, you will receive uh, your summons, which will provide you information how to attend the hearing either via Zoom or telephone or in person. Uh, so you will have the three options to attend. Each initial appearance will be noticed for a specific time. Uh, at this time, we're thinking that um, 15 to 30 minutes for an initial appearance. Uh, most likely, we'll start with 30 minutes. And if we can get cases heard uh, in a more timely fashion, we might reduce it to 15 for each initial. But you will have a specific time that will be designated. If you are participating via Zoom, what will happen is you will log in, you will be put into a wait, waiting room, and when it's time for your case uh, to be heard, so your specific time comes up, you'll then be brought into the courtroom uh, and we'll proceed that way. We will be providing um, some services 
at the initial appearances as we have in the past. So we're working with Legal Aid uh, Volunteer Lawyers Network to allow for attorneys to meet with uh, tenants uh, or landlords if your income qualify. We'll put you in a break room. So there's breakout rooms uh, in Zoom uh, or we will have a separate designated space at the courthouse uh, so that parties can maintain you know, the required social distancing and we will, we will put you um, in a room with either the technolo technology necessary to participate via Zoom uh, or if people are present, it'll be a larger space so that you can talk in a larger space. Um, we are also having uh, a courtroom on the fifth floor designated to housing court. So as you know, we normally have housing court in the two courtrooms on the third floor, but to allow for uh, both referees to be hearing initial appearances at the same time, some initial appearances will be on the fifth floor, some will be on the third floor. Most likely the third floor will be designated for Zoom hearings since it's a smaller non-bridge floor that would reduce the amount of contact people are having. And the fifth floor would be designated for in-person hearings when people uh, are appearing in person. That is a bridge floor and that would allow for more spacing out in the hallway. Uh, at the initial appearances, um, if you are appearing on a non-payment of rent case, we are going to require all landlords uh, or their attorneys uh, to affirmatively state on the record, sworn uh, under oath, that your property uh, does not um, qualify or is not subject to the CARES Act moratorium. Um, so it, the onus will be on the property owners and the landlords and their attorneys to determine whether your property is a covered property under the CARES Act. Uh, and we will be requiring you to affirmatively state that on the record uh, prior to hearing your non-payment of rent case when we start hearing those. Uh, I think those are the main things uh, that we're doing at Housing Court. We are working with all of our court partners uh, to ensure that we still have uh, access to resources for tenants and landlords. We are encouraging, if you are a landlord, we are encouraging you to contact your tenants and try to work out an agreement prior to filing an eviction action. So if your tenants are behind on their rent, you know that when you come to court, we're going to make you talk to one another. You know that we're going to make you try to work something out. So try to do that in advance. Um, if you have a case pending before the court and you reach an agreement, you can file your settlement agreement with the court and we will uh, take a look at it, approve it, and most likely will administratively um, enter that settlement agreement. Um, if you don't have a case pending with the court, that's great. Hopefully you can just work out an agreement and, and you and, and your tenant can move forward without uh, any court intervention. But we do, because of the backlog, I cannot stress to you enough uh, that it's going to be very important for you to have communications with your tenants prior to coming to court, um, particularly on non-payment of rent cases, to see if you can work something out. Contacting the Tenant Resource Center uh, related to either mediation or um, financial resources for the tenant and trying to get things figured out because of the backlog. So I think that pretty much summarizes what I was going to uh, discuss today. I think we're answering questions at the end. I know a couple of questions have come in, um, but I think we're gonna work on those at the end. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna spotlight now um, Heidi. Heidi, you're all set. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Heidi Schmidt Boyd. I work in housing stability for Hennepin County, and referee Hodling set me up perfectly because I'm um, was asked to share about financial resources that are available in for Hennepin County residents to pay rent um, or help um, cover other costs so that they can pay rent. Um, we have been working really hard pre-COVID to coordinate um, and and uh, collaborate between rental assistance um, funds. Right now we have um, several different federal, state, and county resources to help um, people pay their rent. They can be accessed through hennepin.us slash backslash rent dash help. So there's an application there people can use to apply for um, 
they apply, they state their need, they, um, and then behind the scenes, we figure out what pool of money is most appropriate for them. Now, most of these resources are for people who are low income and also have had an, an income loss due to COVID. So that those are the general requirements for those um, rental assistance funds. But um, either way, it's worth it. You know, it's worth it to complete the application, and then at least we'll have the information that can help um, shepherd folks to other resources. If though, if they aren't eligible for the rent assistance, those resources. Um, I also wanted to talk. Um, so, referee Hodling mentioned the Tenant Resource Center. Um, we do have a, a web page, trc2020.com. Um, don't go to trc2020.org because that's Trump's um, re-election re campaign site or something like that. Um, and there you can find, uh, you, tenants can call, we often have landlords call, and, and we have, there's no new resources at, at that site necessarily, but it's a collaborative of mediation, and legal, rent assistance and community uh, resources that can be accessed and we can help um, tenants determine kind of what kinds of information might be helpful. Um, so that this is a uh, yeah, screenshot of, so this is uh, the, the tenant.us uh, rent help page. You can see there's that online application link. If people need help um, and, and don't have a computer or smartphone and aren't able to fill out the form themselves, they can call Call that number 3023160 and we also have um, language supports to help people who um, for whom English is not their first language. Um, in addition, I just mentioned really briefly, I mean there's rent assistance, but also to help people maybe cover other costs um, in their lives to help free up money for rent. I also have um, another website. Um, if you go to apply MN, so A P P L Y M N. There is an application there it's statewide. So for any of you that have properties in other counties, this is applicable as well. People can apply for food assistance um, or um, cash or rent assistance. So it's another great resource for folks who need to extend their, um, their capacity to pay rent. I think that is all I have to cover, but we can take questions later. Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and shift to Sue. Sue, you're spotlighted. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you today. I'm going to go ahead and just share a couple of slides that um, talk through the information that I'm going to cover. Um, so the first thing that I was asked to talk about is what reliable rent supports are out there um, going, ongoing for folks in our community. And um, of course, rent assistance programs have all been paying uh, their portion of the rent to landlords without fail through this time of COVID. Um, so if you aren't currently working with rent assistance programs, now is a really good time to consider them. So uh, these are things like the Housing Choice Voucher, also known as the Section 8 program, VASH, which is a voucher program specifically targeted to veterans that comes with additional case management supports, Bridges vouchers, which are a state-run voucher, but similar to Section 8 and targeted to folks with um, mental health issues. And then a lot of nonprofits have resources um, available through them that are program-based. Um, great examples of those are the um, programs that are for, targeted for folks at risk of homelessness or experiencing homelessness. So that might be like if you contact um, the Bridge or YMCA or Simpson Housing, they often have rent subsidy programs where they're looking to house clients. Um, those programs sometimes go for a couple of months, sometimes six months to even a year. Um, at Housing Link, we also have a risk mitigation fund program called Beyond Backgrounds. And that's where when you rent to a um, household who has barriers that wouldn't have a felony or recent eviction within the last three years, um, a $2,000 insurance policy or risk fund comes along with that for the renter. So there's a lot of great resources um, available in the community to help support renters in um, making those rent payments. And if you're not working with those programs, we strongly encourage it. We often get asked, how do we find these renters? Um, of course, we think a great way is through our website, housinglink.org. 
Um, you advertise vacancies for free through there. All your information is saved, so you can come back and close and reopen vacancies whenever you have them. If you're specifically interested in working with renting to a homeless veteran, the Homes for Veterans program is um, always seeking primarily studio and one bedroom units. Um, and again, local nonprofits. So if you know that like you're passionate about working with a particular population, you might reach out to a nonprofit organization that serves them and see, do you have any programs where you're helping to support renters in the community? And they would be a great resource to um, help to support you in renting to tenants. Um, and I think that I'm gonna just go ahead and turn it over to Beth so that she can cover the next section of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Beth, I Thanks. think you're muted. I, yeah, I'm good now. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody. And I want to make sure I use this chance to thank our, our panelists today, including Larry McDonough, who gave us permission to use that video. But it's important information. It's a lot of information, and it will be posted on CMRS website and the Housing Link website as well, along with some of the handouts or any documents that, that we might be able to share. Um, but I want to introduce myself. I'm Beth Bailey with the Community Mediation and Restorative Services. And I began this work um, back in 1994 as a housing court mediator and feel like I've had this front row seat to all of the changes that have happened in our landlord tenant ecosystem over the last 25 years. And organizationally, our organization has mediated about 15,000 landlord tenant disputes. So one of the things that we are doing is we are changing a little bit how we provide direct services, but we're also trying to lift up some of those themes that we learn from that collective wisdom of all of those mediations and see if we might be able to shape systemically uh, what this world is. And what I wanna do is uh, just share three of those themes and connect it with a specific tip. So one of the themes would be from those 15,000 mediations is, we have a math problem. And what we see in those mediations over and over again are cost burdened tenants and mortgage burdened landlords. And it's getting harder and harder to bridge the gap between what a, a, a tenant can pay and what a landlord needs in order to cover the bill. And I think there's a real role in there for the community to pull up a chair to that mediation and help bridge that gap. And we have started to see that happen. We have more philanthropic organizations that are moving into the space. And uh, with COVID-19, we have tremendously more resources that are moving into the space. And, and Heidi talked a little bit about the $15 million that's been the last addition to the financial resources that are available to us. So one of the ways that uh, mediation has shifted is it's always been our role to help people be prepared for that conversation that they have with each other. One of the things that we're doing is helping tenants to prepare for that conversation by identifying the financial resource that would be available to them prior to having that conversation that ends up with some kind of agreement. Um, so know that when we are talking with your tenants and when you're referring tenants to our organization, that's oftentimes our first place of starting. Uh, our first place to work with the tenant is help them identify and help them navigate the siloed system of resources that we have in our community. We also have heard over and over again from landlords um, that you file eviction in order to shake loose the resources in the community and landlords who will indicate um, that in order to help their tenant, they file an eviction. That has shifted and there's, there's been a recognition that um, it's not a myth necessarily if it stays forever in our community, that idea, and it really needs to be addressed. And that's been shifted and you do not need to file an eviction in order to shake loose some of the resources that are in the community. What you might need to do is provide some kind of date in that um, and you are more than welcome to get the mediators involved in, in to make sure that things are moving along and processing and that you are in the loop in the conversation with what those applications are looking like. We do have a second tier set of financial resources. Um, there are the main ones and we always start people out with the main ones, but 
people come back to us if they end up getting a denial with some of those main ones. Um, the second problem we have is we have a timing problem and we recognize that uh, landlords need to turn over properties quickly because there's profit margins are, are low and the longer you go without bringing in income for that space, uh, the more difficult it is to provide this important resource of housing in our community. Um, we know that the resources tend to take longer than the eviction process takes. And again, there was some great effort uh, to try and address that issue and to streamline and speed up the response, especially from the financial resources. And some of the things that Heidi was talking about that you have one phone number now, if you wanna call the Tenant Resource Center and tenants or landlords can find out what the given resources are that apply to that situation. And this is really an exciting thing with the, the website um, that there is now one website portal and you can submit your application to that, that website portal and that will attach or direct that application to whatever resources are in the mix in that moment. So it's moving in the right direction, but in the current circumstances, timing is not working in your favor. We know that things are going to be backlogged and I would just encourage you to not wait until you have the right to file an eviction, but to get started right now on that conversation that you need to have with your tenants. And if you need help in having that conversation, we are, we are here and we're happy to be there for that. I wanna share um, our, or Heather, if you wanna share for me, uh, the CMRS website. We're trying to keep our housing tab website up to date with some of the resources. So there's a, a, one, a one place that you can go and find out and get the links to some of them. Um, one of the links on here is the Apply MN website that, that Heidi was referencing. Um, actually, I'm not gonna click on it. I'm just gonna let you know that, oh, I guess I did click on it. Um, so it is, this is the, the online website now while the county emergency assistance offices are not taking people in person. Um, we're encouraging people through phone or through online application. And the website for the Tenant Resource Center contains a list of all of the things that they should plan and gather up in order to submit that application. Um, but again, I think the um, understanding that the, all of these systems that are in place to help bridge that gap with landlords and tenants um, there's just a, an unforeseen, unprecedented volume. And if your tenant tells you that they have submitted an application for emergency assistance and they don't know the status yet, there's a really good chance that that's actually the case. That it's just such a heavy volume that it is taking a while to process through that. So don't wait for the moratorium to be lifted to um, start that process. Almost every single one of these financial resources out there, the checks are cut to the landlord and it's your tax ID information that the provider is gonna need. So it's really in your interest to help your tenant find these resources. And if your tenant needs help in filling out that application, there are a variety of language specific resources now that are available to help people navigate that process and uh, get that in. And the third comment I would make um, is that we have a communication problem. And my observation is that a lot of conversations that happen between tenants and landlords tend to be very transactional and they start out and jump right into problem solving and when are you gonna pay the rent and how are you gonna come up with the money for the rent? And in my years of experience in mediating, and this is one thing mediators know, is you can't start a conversation there. You need to start a conversation and make sure that what you are bringing into that space is some humanity and that you're bringing into that space some dignity and you're having a conversation with another human being. And when you jump straight into the problem solving, I'm gonna guess that your outcomes aren't very good with those conversations. And even if you do get them to agree to something, um, the odds that they live up to that agreement, if it, was a, it felt like a, 
a conversation that happened without fairness and without dignity, your outcomes probably are not very good. Um, get somebody who's not so close to it to help you have that conversation and uh, call the mediators. Sometimes we're doing these conversations over Zoom. Sometimes we're sitting together, but oftentimes these are asynchronous conversations that we're having where we're start, starting out being the, the go-between before we bring people together. Um, but these are hard conversations to have, and, and I would encourage you to reach out for help in having those conversations. You are not giving up any authority. You still are the decision maker. Mediators don't make decisions. We just help people have conversations. And one other thing I would add about that is in the environment that we're in right now, when we talk about this in our school services, that sometimes it appears that a student will go from zero to 60 with just a comment made. They didn't go to zero to 60. They walked in the doors of that building at 58. And everybody right now is just trying to hold it together. And that might be you as well. You might not be at zero. You might be starting these conversations at an elevated level. And uh, you might need some help in making sure that it doesn't uh, escalate or into something that you don't want to be, that's something that isn't constructive. So again, um, if we can help, we're, we're happy to, to help with that. And uh, our website, um, Heather, if you wanna show our website again. And we have a new housing only phone number and that phone number is 763. 5610173. Um, these are the resources. And Heather, if you want to shift over to the services tab, please. And it just says how to initiate. And you can initiate by filling out a form. You can initiate by just making a phone call. You can initiate by sending us a, an email address. And uh, we can describe the process to you. You can refer tenants to us too if you want us to start working with those tenants in. Um, being able to have something to bring to that conversation, something concrete. So with that, um, I want to um, bring this part of it to an end. And I think Yana, um, Yana and I are going to do our best to um, moderate some of the Q&A, understanding that we're not going to be able to get through all of the questions. And we will post the recording on our respective websites. That's Housing Link and CMRS. And uh, we will add to that some questions that we didn't have a chance to answer. Um, but I'm gonna um, ask if there's, I think somebody had asked for a copy of the order that the governor just came out. And I'm actually gonna call on Kent and ask him if he would post that yet again. Oh, and I see Yana posted that in the chat section. There is a link there uh, to the order that, uh, Referee Hotelling mentioned. Um. Just to be clear on the orders that the governor issued related to evictions say that the suspension on evictions in Minnesota shall last for the period of time that the peace time emergency is in place or until the order is rescinded. And so yesterday during the governor's um, press conference, he verbally said, I'm extending it 30 days. The legislature can deal with it on Friday uh, when they come into special session. So there's, I, I have not found anything in writing that says it's ex, uh, continued for 30 days, but he said it yesterday during uh, the press conference. So just to be clear, the orders don't say extension on what is or isn't suspended. Um, uh, I wrote a couple questions down that people had posted when I was talking. Uh, one of them was, are all initial appearances going to be on Zoom and how will we know? Um, everyone will get information as to how to participate in the hearing either via Zoom or telephone or in person. We're going to encourage people to participate via Zoom uh, but if they don't have access to the technology necessary, we're scheduling cases so that there is not uh, a concern related to having an excess of people at the courthouse. That's why we're spreading out the hearings. So while Zoom is the preferred method of participating, it will not be the only way that you will be able to participate. Um, someone asked for me to say again, how many cases are backlogged? We have about 350. 
cases that are backlogged. Um, so once the moratorium is lifted, we'll have to start issuing summonses for those cases first. And as you know, then the hearings will be scheduled seven to 14 days out. Um, so there'll be a leg there. And then um, based on sort of how we're anticipating, it's a lot, it's gonna be a little bit of trial and error when we first start to see how the initial appearances work uh, with Zoom and people appearing in person and that sort of thing. Um, but I would anticipate it's going to take us probably around three weeks to get through the backlog uh, of those 350 cases. Um, don't, don't quote me on that. Don't look for an order that says that. Um, that's just my rudimentary math if both referee uh, Sidios and I are handling hearings a majority of the days for initial appearances. But you also have to remember um, that we're also hearing, um, we have to get trials in there at some point. We have to uh, do other obligations that we have related to harassments and, and criminal matters that we handle. So. Um, that's sort of my estimate. Uh, as I said, don't quote me on it, but that's sort of, I think, how things are going to look. That it's going to be much slower than what you're used to or what you've been used to in the past. Heidi, somebody was asking about the resources and what the geographic restrictions are on some of those resources. Yeah, the resources that are available now through the link at tenup.us backslash rent help are all countywide. So um, there's no restrictions um, other than that you're a your Hennepin County resident. And the apply MN, that's statewide? Yeah, apply MN um, will get people access to, to state and federal programs that are statewide. So that application, when you when you load in your address it'll assign those um, applications to uh, the county that of residence so that's um, that apply them in applications for people who need help with food um, snap you know snap benefits um, uh, rental assistance or um, or cash assistance I'll add there's a statewide web uh, mediation organization if you're looking for mediation services outside of Hennepin County. First, there's another partner in Hennepin County called Conflict Resolution Center, and I can share their number too, 612-822-9883. And then there's a, a website that would connect you if you're outside of Hennepin County to mediation services, and that's communitymediationmn.org. Yes, there's a question around if community mediation can help with uh, lease termination cases where it would normally be due to cause of behaviors affecting other residents. Can you answer that one? Yeah, we can do um, voluntary terminations of leases and, and oftentimes, um, especially as this moves along, we do have people that would like to be released from their lease and landlords who would be happy to release somebody from their lease. And uh, we have mediations around what that would look like and how that would happen. Um, we also know that, you know, part of this, uh, everybody walking around um, at 57 instead of zero, we have more neighbor to neighbor kinds of situations that are happening. And while you can't um, forcibly take away somebody's lease right now, you can't evict them. Um, there is sometimes um, conversations that can happen bec between neighbors that will make it easier for everybody to live side by side, or conversations again that you can have where somebody would voluntarily choose to go somewhere else. And then Housing Link becomes one of the important resources for us to be able to help people see what their other options might be if they are voluntarily wanting to, to move. I see the question. There was a question very early on during, during Larry's section that asked, whether it is possible to evict a non-Section 8 tenant in a building that has a Section 8 tenant. So the question is whether the moratorium is attached to the tenant or the building. 
So Yana, we're having a hard time hearing you, but Referee Hoteling, did you hear enough of that to be able to, I, I think the question is, um, if you have Section 8 tenants mm -hmm. in your building, um, can you evict somebody that's not a Section 8 tenant? And I think the answer, I think that the CARES Act and the federal eviction moratorium has more to do with the financing um, in that property. So I think, I think it covers the entire property, but referee hoteling, do you want to add to that? So the answer, uh, is a classic lawyer answer of it depends. Um, so if you have a traditionally financed property, uh, where you have designated one unit section eight, that section eight tenant is covered by, uh, the CARES Act. Um, if you have a property that is uh, financed by the VA or uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, uh, then the entire building is qualified under the CARES Act. And I think there's going to be a question and an argument to be made that if you have allowed one individual in that's a Section 8 tenant, does that then apply to all of the tenants? I don't think that that question has been answered, and I think that it's an argument um, that someone might make on either side. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think there was another question about... Um, there was a squatter question. I wonder if you want to take that one, Referee Hoteling. Sure. There was another question about the CARES Act, about whether the... Um, that I had mentioned that if a property is covered by the CARES Act, the procedure might be different or delayed. Um, yes, that's based on the federal moratorium in the CARES Act. So the CARES Act uh, places a moratorium on evictions through the end of July, I think it's July 25th, on only non-payment of rent cases that have, that qualify under one of these federal programs. And then there's the 30-day notice requirement following um, that the lifting of that moratorium, but the procedure that's going to be different in court is that for all non-payment of rent cases, we, uh, the referees are going to require, uh, the landlords, the landlord's representatives or attorneys for the landlord, um, to make an affirmative statement under oath on the record that by moving forward in their case, their case does not qualify under uh, the CARES Act moratorium. So it's going to be the responsibility of the property owner or the landlord to know whether what the type of financing is, to know whether uh, this tenant qualifies uh, in one of the protected classes that are indicated in the CARES Act. And it might be good to review uh, Larry McDonough's presentation from the beginning because he really did, he covered everything really clearly for you. So if you can review that, that should help you. Um, but if, if your property is covered by the CARES Act, you're going to, you're not going to be able to file the eviction action for non-payment of rent only. Again, you wouldn't be able to file that until probably the end of August is what we're thinking timeline wise. And then the squatter question. Um, so that's a legal question that I am not going to answer. Um, cause I cannot provide any legal advice aside from just guidance on what, what these new executive orders are. So, um, Bruce, I would encourage you to contact an attorney to ask about, about your squatter issue. I think that's no. right. Yeah, I'm aware that we are um, at the end of the time here. I'm just going to do one last question. Somebody who has not received rent for April, May, and June. Uh, but the person is working. Of course, I'm going to recommend that you try mediation and get this agreement into writing and that you both sign off on whatever agreement it is that you enter into. Um, and then added to that agreement is the case developer with the mediation who's going to help that tenant fulfill that agreement by identifying where the resources might be and improving the communication uh, with you. We can always try it anyway. We are at 12.59 and uh, Yana, is there anything you wanted to say?
Thank you for coming. All right. Look for the resources and fill out the evaluation when it gets to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody very much for being a part of this. And, and uh, if we could thank um, our, our panelists collectively, really appreciate you taking the time and uh, fitting a lot of really good information into a short period of time. Thank you so much.